great to be here doing this. Um, I thought I was just going to be basically organising most things, but it didn't. Things don't always work out as you plan entirely. So, uh, what I wanted to look at is something which I began looking at about two or three years ago, in fact, and. Um, it, some of it came out of discussions that I had in uh, Germany with uh, Michael Wimmer um, quite some while ago when we talked about um, fast knowledge and what fast knowledge might be, and I've written a little bit about that, which then took me on to academic entrepreneurship and creativity and so on. So today I'm wanting to look at those terms to a certain extent, and I want to more than anything else, pose a lot of questions. And I don't have the answers. I've got a few thoughts, but not the answers. And I'm, ho I'm hoping, therefore, that you people can um, provide some of these. I do have a lot of slides, but lots of them are pretty pictures, because I'm actually discovered, as I've grown older, I'm actually more visual than I ever thought I was. <laughs> um, words are no longer, they're important to me, yes but I actually like to have visuals as well. I'm finding more and more. And I guess that's part of this new era we're in where we do have the multimedia facility that we never had before, which I think will change very much what we as academics produce. We won't be just producing the words. We're somewhat constrained by our publishers that it keeps to the words because it's a lot more expensive to produce something with the pictures, as we discovered in a recent book from Sense Publishers. So um, this presentation, I have four sections to, um, as, as I want to try and get us to think about reimagining the contemporary university, because I don't believe it's going to stay as it is from now on. There are all sorts of challenges to it, and the university has responded in various ways at different times to the challenges it sees, but I don't think we can even think of quite what we're going to be in 10 years' time, and that's what our VC wants us to, in fact, get involved in something of a task force and trying to, trying to work this out. Futurology. Um, so I think it's one of the significant things that certainly seems to have happened with universities is this particular turn of more recent years, um, this somewhat entrepreneurial term. Now, as you know, I spent the last six years in the US in two different universities, and it became particularly apparent there, I think probably more so than it might have been here. I don't know. I cannot particularly comment for the New Zealand scene. Um, but um, I just wanted to sort of position these two types of universities here, which sort of fits in somewhat with what Peter was doing before. The older style and the new. The new, of course, being Waikato. <laughs> We've got to feature our own. Um, and I wanted to then look, well, what, how do we position this beast called the university? Where is it? So I went to the documentation. Of course, I don't go to print. I go, to the, <laughs> go online to find this information. Um, about, so for what the New Zealand University is supposed to be, how it's sort of defined. And I found this quite interesting because I thought, well, to what extent do we still maintain and stand up to these, this criteria that our 1989 Education Act sets out. And I presented some of this um, in Oxford recently, and so in the UK, higher education is going through lots of struggles and tussles, and so they were somewhat interested to see, see some of these, um, not all these slides, but some of them, and, and to think about what their universities are and, and, and where they're going to go to. So, Pretty standard stuff there in many ways, but I think, and, and that the highlight is not from that document, but that was all a quote from the document about universities don't just train, they educate. Um, they enhance society through their contribution to our understanding of social issues and our achievement of social, economic, and physical well being. Point five is an interesting one. Not, I mean, there's by no means universal criteria for what a university is, but most of them tend to hold various combinations of those elements. Um, and we, of course, as we know, many countries have developed different types of universities. In the US, um, I worked in a tier one university, as in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. <coughs> I also worked in one that didn't rank at Cal State San Bernardino, a teaching primarily, but despite that, we got lots of big research grants, but what we were prevented structurally from doing 
was offering a PhD. We ended up being one of the first of the Cal State System University to be able to offer an EDD. There were about 11 of us who put this up. And in fact, Michael and I were instrumental in getting that going, and he would consult with them and so on. So the structures are really important into what constitutes a university and what it can or can't do, and therefore where it's going to rank or not rank at all, as the case may be. So those are quite important issues, I think, that, that to acknowledge that we're we're not talking about the same thing all the time, and what are we talking about in this, in this situation? Well, I would argue very strongly, and I think many of you would <laughs> be well aware of it, that the late 20th century under the neoliberal policies, we've certainly seen a shift in, in how the new university functions, how it operates, how it sees itself even in many ways that with the marketisation that has occurred the notion of having to make a profit. In fact, I see that it seems to be organised very much along the line of various profit centres. And don't get me on various things that we've had to do to organise this conference <laughs> and what the university takes from it or requires from it or charges from it or whatever. Um, but throughout the Western world in particular, um, and really I think even though I think the, most of the um, Asian universities seem to certainly be following this neoliberal model. model. It's not just us by any means. And really, the, the two key points I think are that there has been a de-emphasis of the social in many ways, apart from access. Um, but other aspects of university life, I think, have somewhat diminished in terms of social policy. Um, where, whereas, you know, education is just another commodity. It's, uh, clearly made that, makes that very clear in many policies. Um, and where we find that managerialist, HR, RAE-style accountabilities, um, PBRF accountabilities here in NZ, um, and profit centres certainly seem to rule. You know we, know, we know the stories, you can't run your class unless you've got X number in it anymore. That's one of the big changes, I think, in this environment, apart from which you need to bring in money. And in my worst moments, I can become very cynical. I can sometimes think that we are primarily job training institutions, not much more than that, with a bit of research, you know, whatever. And when I see that we define our, many of our depart, what have been departments or sections or whatever you want to call them, as a school of, a college of, you start to see that emphasis. We know that it means there's usually some directly professionally oriented training, education training, um, and that in the, within the structure there is often very little room for anything. We know that this is what's resulted in the attacks on the humanities and the diminution of those areas as useful knowledge becomes the predominant mantra. In fact, we actually had that um, mentioned very specifically to us at the University of Glasgow. That notion was promoted by the head of research there. And it was very worrisome, I might add, <laughs> especially since his degree was in engineering and in sewage. <laughs> Mind you, that's useful. <laughs> um, and so we're also tied to there now, to these research assessment exercises. We're also tied, I haven't put in there, to teaching assessment exercises. We are being assessed constantly. Um, and it worries me that this critic and conscience function does seem to have slipped somewhat. It certainly seems to be, it exists, <laughs> I, I think you'd have to say, and you could, but I think it's been subsumed or been assumed under other areas and, and sort of sits there sort of, but is no longer as prominent <coughs> as it might have been. Um, I think that we do the critical function remarkably well. We don't necessarily come up with solutions or ideas for <coughs> You see how to make things different. We're very good at criticising, but I don't think we're perhaps so good at developing on from there. And I think I'd like to see us be able to do a bit more of that, perhaps. And maybe that's just because I've not been in New Zealand universities long enough. Um, and the conscience, but as I said, maybe less apparent. Um, but I, I think we need to look at where that social responsibility aspect lies. And I don't think it's enough to just be access. Now, the contemporary world, unfortunately, we are in various funding crises in our world at the moment. G 
governments have this horrendous fiscal crisis happening, um, where all sorts of aspects which come under government funding are being cut. We've also got um, demographic challenges, um, us ageing baby boomers, um, retiring and um, the costs for prisons, welfare and so on, um, all demanding shares of government budgets while the worker base is diminishing in many instances, partly because of the older group retiring or about to, and the other aspect being increasing unemployment as a result of this horrible fiscal crisis and that the world is experiencing. Um, in many countries, especially in the EU, the statistics are horrendous, even for graduates, for unemployment. Um, so then people start to question, well, what's the point of going to university if I'm going to be unemployed? What are they really providing for me? Um, which brings us back to job training, I suppose. Um, but also, universities have positioned themselves in a different manner. Rather than being a regional, national um, being, they've become this globalised, internationalised um, institution, often involved in export education of very, under its various guises, again, bringing in money, particularly, aimed to that. I mean, there's the altruistic thing about, oh, it's nice to get on well with people and let's go and work out how we can all sort of get, to get on well together. And I don't, don't dispute that aspect either. But I, I do think a lot of it is to do with, again, I, I might be a little cynical, a lot of it's to do with bringing in the money. <laughs> um, and, and the other aspect, certainly in the USA was, and, and in the UK, was bidding for research money. We were told very clearly that was a major part of our jobs. And you spend a lot of time doing it. I know here we do, but we don't have those huge fund availabilities that we have over there in those locations. Um, certain people's jobs are totally tied to this soft money. It's called, I don't think it's particularly soft at all. It looks pretty hard to actually even get it, let alone <laughs> deal with it once you had it. Um, but those aspects of bidding for external research grants, and we would go to like, a faculty-wide meeting in, in Illinois, and the first thing that got put up was all the, the amount of the research money. Ian, yeah, Nadine's nodding. What really counted was the research money that came in, how many million it was, who got it, which departments, therefore, very good. You might have produced books. <laughs> Don't even get a mention. <laughs> Um, so the emphasis of, on that starts to shift the work that gets done, who it gets done for, our subjectivities as academics and our creativity. We've also been encouraged to, universities have wanted to get this money in. You keep being told getting the money in is really important. So they've been encouraged to become academic entrepreneurs. And what it has, I think, usually been an overly narrow conceptualization of that particular concept. Uh, it ignores social entrepreneurship and ignores uh, not-for-profit aspects. It tends to focus on the money. I'm not averse to money. I like to be paid well. I don't like to be paid nothing, but, you know, you just sort of want to... Now, I'm providing this exemplar very briefly of Illinois because... Um, this is an example of how this, the public aspect of a university is very much geared towards funding. Once the state funding starts to diminish, you then have to ask the question, well, is it still a public institution? And this is one of the questions that various US universities have actually been asking of recent times. The University of Wisconsin has asked this question. Uh, UCLA certainly has and some parts of their school, I believe the business school and the law school, have actually um, hived off somewhat into a private section now because the state is broke in both <laughs> Illinois and, um, and California and they've decided, they've cut back what they're prepared to fund or able to fund and so people are then saying, well, if that's the case, why do we need to deal with state bureaucracy, you know? Do we really need this? Do we need that, you know, underneath this particular threshold? And so this is one of the ramifications of this particular fiscal crisis that is occurring. And then it starts to change, too, the functions of the university. 
we don't have that in New Zealand. I believe universities in New Zealand are about 70, 75% funded by the state. Hmm? Uh, VC said 70 the other day. <laughs> but I'm not sure, but that's it's quite a high percentage that overall state funding for the university, but it's certainly much higher than the US. So I thought Mary Collance has made an interesting comment when she did this. She was the dean in education there, and she did this uh, university-wide report about, well, what do we do in this crisis? Um, how do we do address this, apart from <clears throat> getting people to take days off, as in furlough, early retirement, voluntary severance, etc., etc., and increase the tuition fees, as she emphasises, you know, the goals of our social and scholarly work are to maximise our public value as a source of ideas and learning. And I think that's a pretty useful comment to make, an important thing to keep in mind about what we are and who we are. So, well, what is this jolly beast called academic entrepreneurship? It's sort of a bit of an oxymoron like creative university, really. Um, and it's about changing and extending the traditional role of universities in many ways. Um, changing those functions that I've already mentioned. Um, and as I've said, I believe this new um, conceptualization currently tends to be much too narrow. I believe it should include those other aspects, the social and public aspects as a form of creativity in the public domain much more. We don't tend, we just don't tend to even look at that aspect particularly. Um, when a, I look at a taxonomy uh, associated with this, this particular paper, all of the articles focus on this particular narrow conceptualisation. 173 articles, only over a very short period of time since this term has come into our lexicon. Um, and, and they look at these streams and Entrepreneurial <coughs> Research University, Productivity of Technology Transfer Offices, New Firm Creation, Environmental Context, including Nexus. And it's, this literature is expanding considerably, but it tends mostly to be in the management, organisational type area of, um, of research, and does certainly focus on commercial and for profit. Um, but of course, we know that we actually are actually very creative in lots of ways. We, we, we create huge amounts of intellectual property, enormous amounts of it, for good or for bad, of great quality sometimes, of lesser maybe others, but we do, that's what we do, it's part of our work, not just the teaching side of things. Um, and this particular term is, is about capitalising an effect on our talents and our expertise as employees of this institution, or our institutions. Um, and it, so far it has certainly emphasised science, medical and technology areas, undoubtedly, because we know there are great possibilities in these areas and, um, and that potential income from those areas are quite considerable. Um, aiming to convert these scientific breakthroughs or whatever into some sort of spin-off business or company, industrial or commercial <coughs> success. But it, I think it is certainly much wider than the hard sciences. In fact, that's what I'm arguing. Um, but this does mean that we get into some controversy and discussion and unease even about what is the appropriate role and function of the university, which takes me sort of back in a bit of a loop to the the first, the earlier slide there about the role of the universities. Now, is that really our function, people will ask? Should, should we really be doing that? Um, well, I guess it's, nowadays it's not quite much, so much should we, <laughs> it's more like are we? It's like this is, this is how it is. Um, but what are seen then as legitimate entrepreneurial academic activities? What about the profit and not-for-profit ones? Where does social entrepreneurship fit? And of course, who's a knowledge worker and a knowledge manager, and what does that really mean? And I would argue that rather than just those areas in the sciences, medicine, and so on, um, and IT, that really it's a lot more. It is that, but it's a lot more. Publishing, we forget that publishing is a massive industry, and we are very involved in it. Some of us more than others, but we are. Uh, there is performance. We forget that too. 
this consultancy, of course, contract research, our external fundings. Then we've got the commercial activities, these newer funds. These are the traditional ones, really, we've done for a long time in our universities. And then these newer ones are, in fact, these commercial and the spin-off companies. So here's our traditional publishing. Way, way back, this is in uh, the cathedral in Toledo, the St. Louis Bible. We had people sitting there, scribes, creating these amazingly detailed, colourful manuscripts. These days we have online publishing of various sorts. We still have paper too. So I, of course, happened to put up educational philosophy and theory, nothing like giving <laughs> a plug to one of our sponsors. Um, and um, a report, it's not my report, and the latest book that I've just done. And just gave a copy to Peter Murphy, who's got a chapter on it as well. Um, so academic publishing books and journals are a very important part of our academic entrepreneurship work. But we've seen in this lately this enormous change, though, in academic publishing. And this is another whole paper, another whole presentation, which I'm not going to go into here. Um, but um, we've seen this merger happening. Michael mentioned it yesterday, and, and uh, Simon did too. We've got fewer and fewer big publishers in this multi-billion dollar industry, and pro dominated now by those few there, pretty much. Taylor and Francis, Wiley, Sage, Springer, Sylvia, Thompson, Pearson, Palgrave, Macmillan, Norton, Peter Lang, McGraw-Hill. And we've had somewhat of a demise of university presses along the way, except the more elite ones. So the number of places we are able to put our work out to in the, that side of things has perhaps diminished. And yet there's been a massive growth in journals. <coughs> OK, so these current issues, of course, again, Michael alluded to yesterday when he talked about the Finch report, that we provide the work for free, essentially. I don't know how many of you get lots of royalties from books, but most of us don't. <laughs> it's um, minimal, unless you have a highly successful textbook published by Pearson or McGraw-Hill that goes everywhere and costs $120, and every student in 101 <laughs> English or whatever has to, has to use. Most of the time, the work that we, we get small publication runs, and we think we're doing pretty well, and we've got over 1,000, 1,500. 2,000, 3,000, whoa, doing well. Um, so small runs of books in particular. Um, our salaries are paid by the mostly publicly funded universities, or if you're in a private one, by that institution. And we provide free the work associated with peer review of journals and books and so on. Publishers tend to hold the copyright. We don't tend to so often, and, if you, and, and this is one thing I certainly advise people to look at when you read the fine print of a contract when you get a book contract. And of course now there's this objection to this um, situation and the control, and not so much even the control, in fact the cost, more than the control seems to be the issue, the cost of knowledge in that respect um, through the Wellcome Trust, Tim Gowers and so on, objecting to this. Um, and this is this Finch report Michael mentioned yesterday. I thought, oh, he's keeping taking my slides. <laughs> you know. uh, collaboration, whatever. But there was real concern that this report, which is seen as a gold standard, in effect, a gold model, where authors pay up front from their paper, just is not a model that's going to work in the social sciences or humanities. There's real concern that it's not going to work for early career academics. You know, where on earth as a PhD student, going to get the money funded for publishing an article? I don't think so. Really, it, it just isn't going to happen. And then what about the people who are on contract positions? A lot of the US universities have, uh, there, is do, there is documentation in the Higher Education Journal showing the huge increase in people in contract positions rather than in tenured positions. What's going to happen to them? Is it what's going to happen to departmental finances? Are they going to pay for it? Who's going to front up with the money? What's going to happen to the learned societies? PISA, Philosophy Education Society of Australia, I'm not going to tell you how much we earn, but we earn quite a lot of money from educational philosophy and theory. 
which enables us to run conferences, which enables us to fund scholarships for PhD students, we fund two a year, which enables us to possibly look to in the future, we hope we can perhaps fund some other things like that. But we have charitable academic work that happens in around our learned society. And it would be a bit of a worry if this starts to shift too much, I think, for us. And, and when I discussed with the people in the UK and higher ed there about this, they were, had great concern. They said, we were not consulted. They did not consult anyone in the social sciences. They did not consult anybody in learned societies. So, and of course, I think we all know about these limitations of citation analysis. I probably don't need to go too much there. I mean, I'm not trying to sort of get at anything of what Simon says, but this just to perhaps round out the picture a little about what this is and how it is controlled in many ways. The, the sort of the sort of somewhat of the downsides of this, the cultural language bias, the Anglo bias, uh, you know, English lingua franca bias. The fact that it does tend to marginalise local and indigenous knowledges because it's got to be international. And, and this has often been an issue, I know, for Māori to get stuff published internationally in an international journal. It's not going to happen easily mm -hmm. as it is for other stuff that's seen as global. So there's a real issue there. We also know that there's a favouring of the natural sciences over the social science and humanities. But the real thing that bugs me and worries me intensely, more than that, because those can be dealt with to a certain extent, that's not transparent how you actually even get on, how a journal gets onto it. EPAT got onto it just this last year, into, this, into the index. But is the ownership, Thomson Reuters Corp, look it up, it's incredible. They are, they're very big. And what worries me is not just Thomson Reuters, it's the combination of Thomson Reuters and Pearson together. They own so much of our academic product, not, not just product even, but systems. And if you, and I, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's instructive for us all to know what is this parameter within our academic industry within our academic entrepreneurial life, within our publishing life, the web of knowledge. And you can go online and find this, that's why I'm not going to belabor this. But it gives you access, objective content, and powerful tools to search, track, measure, and collaborate in the sciences, social sciences, arts, and humanities. A multidisciplinary research platform, and yes, it includes all these things, web of science, Chinese science citation database, Current contents connect and Derwent Innovations Index, and they're all they're all um, patented. You got your we we do data there for that. And this research platform and what's available on it, I mean, it's just phenomenal. It's been putting together, accumulating ways in which we can be judged in many ways through these indexes of various sorts. It's very helpful for us in many ways because it's a, a, these massive databases. As it says, you choose the resources you need. There's no need to subscribe to unnecessary or extraneous databases. Now, librarians will tell you that's always a bit of a worry because they get sold a package yeah. of journals yeah. and this whole lot of stuff they don't want to be bothered with. Um, so yes, that becomes attractive. It combines renowned multidisciplinary databases with content-specific sections, etc. The web of knowledge. So they are the web of knowledge. And as I said, they tell you on the website why you should use them as well. They're also the Ontario Public Employee Superannuation. Yeah. So you know, here you go, dear old Thomson Reuters. Well, I'll leave the publishing side for now. Performance. This is a performance. <laughs> no, I'm not going to start. <laughs> I'm not that good anymore. Um, I've, I'm focusing up here on um, what the building here is the Gallagher Performing Arts Centre at University of Waikato, of which we are very proud. It was funded by one of our entrepreneurs who I believe went through the university, uh, Sir something Gallagher. Michael Gallagher, something like that, so, in any case, who was uh, 
instrumental in making sure electric fences were used in farming throughout New Zealand and the world. Made a fortune. And at least he's giving us back something. He's got, we've got this beautiful centre there on the lake. Fabulous. Marvellous. And in actual fact, performances associated with us. We have a famous opera singer here now, Dame Malvina Major, has now become one of our faculty. She gives performances here. Other people do as well. And yet we don't seem to think of this particularly much in terms of academic entrepreneurship, yet clearly it is in some ways. And the university may or may not make money for it, but it will certainly gain some uh, kudos, at least. Okay, music, dance, art and sport. We often forget that. Most universities, or many universities, liberal arts ones, certainly still have art departments of various sorts, or design or creative arts music, various ones, and so on. And I think uh, some of them may well be relatively recent too. Uh, I think there was a big push for that more in the perhaps the mid-60s than, than earlier on. And in sport, well coming from University of Illinois, and the UNS University, sport. Um, one shot there, left hand shot there is of the um, memorial Hall, they call it, built for as a war memorial end of First World War, where the football games are held. Um, the, the colours of Illinois are orange and blue, which I can probably get a bit of an idea of. And then the other one is in the Mushroom Building, which is a marvellous um, modernist building. S superb design, it's sort of this white shape, and I, I should have perhaps put one of those as well, but we hold ball games where we have... Um, uh, concerts and things. I saw Bob Dylan in there not so long ago, which was interesting. Just before he turned 70. <laughs> <laughs> His band was very good. He was perhaps less. But it was marvellous. You know, I mean, that's the sort of wonderful thing that we can, we can get in many places and universities. But of course, the interesting thing is the sports coaches get paid more than the university president, well, of course. And spin-offs, of course, we get them in medicine and psychology, sports physiology and so on. So, it's not just about the ball game. It's more than that. When we come to spin-off companies, we've got a whole lot of these. Um, and um, again, this is one of the big ones that was at Illinois, the National Centre for Supercomputing Applications. Um, Illinois made an effort to make sure that most of its buildings, even new ones, were, had similar themes with the... Um, brick because it was um, established uh, late uh, 19th century. Um, but what it did, and probably one of the most significant and early of the university spin-off type companies was Mosaic. It was developed there by Mark Andreasson. You may be aware of all the court cases and things that happened against the University of Illinois and Mark Andreasson, but this was one of the significant starts, I think, very much of, in the early, mid-90s, of these sorts of spin-off companies developing, and then the idea of them have having that sort of company occurring. Um, Mosaic no longer exists. I think Andreasson and the Netscape people are particularly involved in Mozilla these days. But here's some other sorts of examples. I'm going to flick through these. Flying robots for people. Spin-off company. Amazing. You can Google some of these and find them yourself if you like, and you you start to get a picture of the sorts of things they are. And many of them are very interesting. Um, very interesting. Um, a Swedish one, games, of course. Um, so yes, apparently these are the. Not being terribly into games myself, I, I found these interesting. But I, you kids may be into these. Fumbies, the cloud creatures. Um, and, and you get these other ones, these software reconstructors, laser scanners and so on, these high-tech type ones as well. Italian company, another Italian company, which, you know, involve with, they're also involved with solar energy as well. So this is not just an American thing, by any means. It's spread much further than the US of A, happening throughout Europe in many cases is really part of the picture I want, I want you to portray. Um, and there are very powerful forces, of course, that drive that. I don't think I need to go into that particularly. But what I do want to go into more is 
the, this interesting quote from Spinoza, Flores, and Dreyfus, where they see um, entrepreneurial practices as being really important for solidarity and democratic action, and that through this we make history. Um, but I want to see more of this public entrepreneurship. I'm going to put the bottom of that slide. A, a more innovative, a citizen oriented focus. New ethnic models, therapeutic communities, for example, artisan and artisans that embrace the social concept. So it's not just left in that area. And education, after all, is profoundly social. And I really think, I mean, there are some examples, and I've got a few here to show you there. Um, there are some examples of social entrepreneurship. But that work and the very notion just doesn't exist in an education faculty I, that I know of. Maybe you do, but I don't. Those notions tend to exist within management areas. But one of the things they did try to do in Murrid, Illinois, was they set up, uh, they wanted everyone, all faculties, colleges, whatever, to be engaged in some notion of entrepreneurship. And they set up a system called um, the Academy for Entrepreneurial Leadership. And they gave us some funding when we, if you were successful, and Michael and I were successful. And we put up a course, a master's course, on academic entrepreneurship and creativity, which was part of our online global studies and education course. So, they, they, and, and what it did was it got people from different faculties starting to meet together and work together and think, think ideas. So it wasn't just isolated in the business school. It's gone back there now because the, the funding for this, which came from an outside source, the five million has dried up. <laughs> five, it was for five years and it got things underway and was, then after that, the usual story, that's like seeding money, five million dollars, and you expected to find your own way. Um, but this notion of social entrepreneurship, I've taken this from the Stanford website, is becoming much more important and seen as a very and valid aspect of, um, of life, the meaning of life, um, for many people now. And so you have Stanford providing this as part of their executive program. So it's no longer like executives expecting to only be involved in for profits. A lot of them are now starting to get involved is because they don't like this who just working in that area. They want to do something different. So the Stanford uh, Centre is quite an interesting one. And I've got a few examples. When I had a bit of a search, I started to find that um, there were some examples in education, but again, it was more the people who were from the executive management schools who would then be, or successful business people who would then put some of their money into these areas because there are big tax advantages in the US. But we've got Anne Cotton, who's actually MBE, she's from Cardiff, who's been uh, really important in female education in Africa um, and looking at, uh, from a grassroots approach. So you start, you do get these people and they're involved in education in some way. Um, you've got Eric Schwartz in the, in the US about after school programs, um, certainly in urban areas in particular. In Paraguay, um, teaching students to become entrepreneurs themselves, teaching practical knowledge, Teddy Bletcher in South Africa, um, try, his, his work there, um, taking this holistic approach to, to sort of provide um, higher ed to a, a smaller er villages and so on. So, <coughs> creativity. I think it's quite nice that John Halkins comments about it. Uh, it it emphasises that it's it's just not one thing, it's multiple. Multiple ways, multiple ideas and so on. And I, I like the um, being reminded about our capacity to dream, wander, think, challenge, disagree and invent. Um, yeah, we sometimes need reminding about that. We know pretty much, as far as definitions are concerned, we've got the old romantic notions of Schumpeter, you know, the mad genius and the garret or whatever. Um, isolated person, but we've shifted considerably in our modern world. We've certainly become 
much more aware that we have this, we are a, a world where ideas have taken over so much more. I don't think we were lacking in ideas before, we're, but we're working together on ideas and collaborating in a team approach has become particularly important. Um, Roma's uh, work makes this, I think, very clear, his, his, idea, his um, concern about meta ideas and so on. And some of this ground has already been covered in, in previous talks and things already today, in the last couple of days. Um, the challenge now facing all of the industrialised countries is to invent new institutions, which is why I'm talking about perhaps reinventing universities, that encourage a higher level of applied commercially relevant or not necessarily commercially relevant research and development in the private sector. I would alter that slightly. And again, this is this notion of creativity that's already pretty much been mentioned about it being this broader conceptualisation. Won't belabor that. Those are the three books by the three miscreants we've already had. <laughs> Michael, Peter and Simon. <laughs> In case you didn't know what they looked like. Creativity in the Global Knowledge Economy, Global Creation and Imagination. Part of a burgeoning literature. And another one, Education in the Creative Economy, um, which looks at exploring this in terms of learning and education with all sorts of name contributors there. So the creative economy, multiple sites, multiple spaces, neighbourhoods, not just one location. Um, but I think Peter was sort of getting there to a certain extent what you were saying about a spaces and about your environment. And I think all of us find that certain environments suit us better to work in for creativity than others. I tend to do most of my work at home <laughs> at night and often in the middle of the night. I don't tend to do, I do my admin work and the busyness work and that's in the, in the university precinct. I don't tend to do it there. Um, yes, the middle of the night is true. <laughs> Between three and five in particular. <laughs> and the cat gets up and decides that she knows what the mouse pad is all about. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's about the emphasis on symbolic goods, on symbolic ma manipulation, on sign value, on digital goods. Um, and so this starts to change that notion of entrepreneurship quite considerably. I'm going to run out of time, of course, but that's all right. I wanted to just flick through some of these, because there's lots of ideas here, I think, for us to think about, for what we see this and what we see it becoming. And partly to do with this is the fact that it's been fairly well established now by various theorists that um, knowledge does differ from another product. Even though we've got the neoliberal model telling us it's a product, it's a commodity, it's different. It's non-rival, partially, you know, in, 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 the, in this respect, um, that's a, probably the crucial difference. It's not necessarily going to depreciate. It might, if it's certain types of knowledge. It can be added to by working in a team. Uh, you're not, you're not going to diminish it. So that's one of the important things. And of course, the other aspect is this, the, the collaborative, commons-based peer production that has emerged and the formats for allowing for that. Um, P, P to P as, as part of the openness movement, the peer to peer movement, and how this changes that relational dynamic of creativity, innovation, and so on. Now, I wanted to go through in the last section very, very quickly because there's lots of pictures. Called the Creative University. Um, um, creative teaching, creative learning. I mean, this could be another whole presentation. It's not going to be. Um, but I really do think we do need to look at institutional design in all sorts of ways. I think we have got to look at changes in policy, for one thing. I mean, I get driven insane by having multiple committees to have everything being passed through. I mean, I'm not an autocrat, really. But <laughs> I just don't want to have ten committees to look at one fairly simple idea. It just does, it's non-creative, <laughs> non-functional really. It gets there in the end, but it's exasperating. You think, oh, can I be bothered? Um, you know, and, and is an accountability measure like teaching assessment, research assessment, is it actually enabling creativity or not? 
Okay. What about our social and moral comp competencies and so on? What, what are we doing? Well, we, we know about changes in pedagogy. We know that's happened already. The online stuff is already there and already happening. That's changing things. Um, the use of multimedia and internet resources. We know the university has become networked in a way that it perhaps hasn't before. Um, we know that we can also work collaboratively across universities on various research projects and writing projects and so on. But in revisiting the university, we had hoped to get somebody here from Bangkok University because they have been establishing themselves as this creative university. So that's why I said I want to flip through to get some of these pictures. This is underway. This is happening now. <laughs> it's not only design, it's creating an environment of very different... Has anybody been to Bangkok University? Now, that is a good excuse to go, isn't it? <laughs> Have you? Is this happening that you've noticed there, Peter? I didn't see this development. Right. I was there several years ago. Well, it's this... Um, yeah, that, that they've designed these floors of, of a new four-storey building and this whole complex they're designing and going to build, apparently. Um, and it's to... In, it's for the students to out re change their space, to change how they relate to each other and um, how they spend time not just studying but enjoying themselves. Since when were students allowed to enjoy themselves? Only when I went to university went to <laughs> and all the boys played slippery salmon pontoon upstairs and the girls would sit down below and drink coffee and things like that. Or try and get, get off with the boys that were upstairs, the cool ones, you know, who weren't bothering to study. In any case, that's another story. So there's this local design organisation called Super Machine Studio, led by local key designers who've developed this particular space on this campus in north, north of Bangkok. I'm thinking, hmm. <laughs> now that would be nice, maybe. Maybe you wouldn't like it. But I mean, to change how you see the use of spaces and and design and, and make things different for you. Because in an internet world, you know, universities can get very hollowed out. They can become like the Murray Celeste. You know, we could go down corridors and there'll be nobody in their offices, you know. Just no one. Empty. Why do we have them? It's a waste of money. So this is a way to try and encourage the community aspect for students. Giant panda. <laughs> Wicked. <laughs> Quite fun, really. <clears throat> okay. Other aspects. So I'm just flicking through those. You can look this up yourself on that. But I think it's quite exciting, you know. I know it's different and new, anything new is often very exciting, but, you know, I'm not sure whether it will achieve what they want, but I wouldn't mind betting it does. Um, so, yeah, they've, they've got this um, game zone. I did mention the pool table when I was at University of Canterbury. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically what I want to get at is that we have this crisis at the moment, global fiscal crisis. We've got a situation where, like in Spain, youth unemployment is 50% and many of those are graduates. <coughs> this is not good. Not good at all. Um, and in the US, we've got the weak labour market where half of these young college graduates aren't getting jobs. Horrendous stuff happening for many of them. And so there's been protests there. You can pay 40000 a year to the law school and no job at the end of it. These are meant to be training as job training institutions. They're not functioning as they're meant to. What are we going to do? Take them to court. It's the US. <laughs> you might get somewhere. No, I think they threw it out. And so they end up with a double whammy of high tuition fees and but poor job prospects. And then there are all manner of implications for universities. You know, do they close down a department? Well, in some cases they've diminished the level of enrolment. But this is where they're saying the jobs are going likely to be. Um, teachers, college professors and accountants. 
enjoy by means such as retail sales, fast food, truck driving jobs, which aren't easily replaced by computers. So, what's the story? We've been seeing social unrest in all sorts of places in the world. Young people, as we know, get together, as does some of us oldies do, through social media, no longer accepting the status quo. If you're unemployed and you're clever, you can get up to all sorts of mischief. <laughs> Don't we know it? <laughs> so how, did, how can universities meet these demands? What can we do? All sorts of demands on us. Do they really need to change? Should they? I'll leave it at that. <laughs>